So hello everybody, welcome to my presentation, Eight Years of Farming, is everybody happy? Uh, my name is uh, Geert Uitroeven, uh, I'm a freelance embedded Linux kernel hacker, uh, I have my own uh, one person company. I started with Linux uh, as a hobbyist a very long time ago and I've contributed to lots of uh, subsystems and parts of the Linux kernel. Uh, I'm still maintainer of the M68K architecture and the uh, last uh, few years uh, I've been contracted by Renesas to do work on their uh, on, uh, on upstreaming support for the SOCs and in, as this uh, part of this work is being maintained for the Renesas clock, pin control and ARM SOC platforms. So this presentation will have two parts. The first part uh, will be about my board farm. So eight years ago at the uh, Embedded Linux conference in Berlin, I gave a presentation, Hurt, Hurt Your Board to Become a Farmer. And in this presentation, I will uh, continue with that and tell you about things that have changed in my farm and things that worked well, didn't work well and uh, stuff like that. And the second part of the presentation uh, will be about uh, uh, providing remote access to the boards in your farm and not uh, to your whole local computer infrastructure. So uh, first, what's a board farm? Uh, for me, it's a collection of single board computers or development boards that are in some sense or place and that can be accessed remotely in a uniform way. So remotely, that uh, can mean inside your office or home office or uh, from, from abroad as well. Uh, what do I use this for? Uh, I use it mainly for uh, development, for kernel work, maintenance, some testing, debugging, uh, basically for the same things like I use the few boards that are still sitting on, uh, on my desk. Uh, having a board form is a convenient access, uh, way to provide access to multiple boards on your desk, you usually have only a limited amount of space. Uh, if you're working from home, then the family may not like it, but your uh, desk looks uh, a bit too cluttered. So it's also a way to keep my desk clean. A disadvantage of putting a board in a board form, of course, is that it's harder if you need physical access, if you need to measure something with a logic analyzer or connect something, then you, you have to come over to that place. Uh, in my board form, I also have support for remote access and other people are using it as well, also for development, testing and debugging. Some of them are even using it with automated testing, using their own uh, automated testing framework. And the main reason why they do this is because they don't always have a board available, either because it's a specialized board or there's a limited number of boards available or it can be expensive. Um, sometimes people use boards in my form for special things like, uh, for example, even for uh, bring up of uh, bootloader support in, uh, in SOC over JTAG, which is then connected to some other boards. So they basically use two boards in my form to, where one of them is used to control the other one. So back to uh, eight years ago. Uh, at that time, I had six boards in my farm. Uh, they were all powered from a, a one single PC power supply with some terminal blocks and fuse holders. To, uh, I used the BeagleBone Black uh, to control everything in the farm. And the BeagleBone Black was powered by the standby power of the PC power supply, which means that it was always on. Uh, for power control and measurement, I used the Bay Libre Acme Cape for the BeagleBone Black which uh, lets you control power for eight boards and measure power consumption as well. I had some custom uh, board with uh, opto isolators so I can uh, emulate uh, key presses or pressing on the reset button. So I have remote reset control and wake up. I had a 16 port ethernet switch, 10 port USB hub and a quad USB serial adapter for boards that only provided uh, uh, UART on uh, on pins or on a connector, not, uh, not on USB serial bridge. At that time, my board form looked a little bit uh, experimental. So it, uh, I built it on an old kitchen table. Uh, it, oops. 
So here you can see the, the Beagle Bone Black with the, the ACME cape for power control. And then you have the various boards sitting around it. For power distribution, I use this, which is basically terminal blocks hidden inside a, a Lego construction. Uh, it looked quite nice, I thought, at that time. And that I had a, a voltage mon monitoring with these small uh, uh, LED voltmeters. And the center, you see fuse holders. And on the right, there are more terminal blocks. But of course, that's still a bit uh, experimental. The opto isolators, I had uh, put them on a prototype board, so with some uh, prototype soldering, which also looked quite uh, not that professional. Now, fast forward uh, to, the, to the day. Uh, I moved everything on a metal uh, rack. And you can see some boards at the top. There's still some Lego involved, which is nice for holding stuff. So you have two racks with boards. There are uh, six boards here on top, uh, four more boards. This is basically the control layer with the beagle bone blacks, USB hubs, the opto isolator boards, four more boards, the JTEC adapter, which is used to control this board here. And at the bottom, you have the power and ethernet. So let's go into more detail about what actually changed. The first thing I did was uh, replace the, the opto isolator boards, which were implemented on, 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 a, on a proto board on a real PCB. So I, I thought it was a great time to learn KiCad. So if you don't know KiCad and you're interested in electronics, you should really do it. And it's actually quite easy. There are lots of tutorials on the internet. So, so I made a PCB for that and then got component and soldered it and it worked well. I replaced the, the Lego contraption best by something that uh, is more industrial and safer. Um, so here you see a, a piece of uh, wood with uh, a DIN rail on top of it. And then I use the terminal blocks uh, from Phoenix Contact mounted on the DIN rail. And it's much easier to extend and to wire. And uh, the nice thing is that you, these terminal blocks, you can get different variants, uh, for example, these here, they, uh, these are fuse holders. So you can have integrated fuses inside all the, your, your, your power distribution box. They also have component holders, which I use for uh, TVS diodes, just in case there's some uh, over voltage if uh, something goes wrong with the power supply. Um, the, as you saw before in the picture, I put everything on a metal shelf, which is grounded as well. And last but not least, I added a smoke, made sure there's a smoke detector in that room in case something goes wrong. So about the ground shelf and uh, using a single PC power supply. Um, if you use the normal power supplies that come with the bar, they're usually these very small bricks, wall, also called wall wards. They usually don't have a ground connection, but only uh, AC power input. Even if they have a ground connection, it's not always wired to something else on the output side. So the disadvantage if you use these wall wards is that you get, for example, with the 12 volt one, a 12 volt difference between the two ter terminal outputs. And another one, you, which is five volt, you get a five volt difference there. But then the question is, what's actually the, the voltage difference between the, the so-called ground output or the zero volt level on one and on the other one. So there can be quite some difference there. And if you co connect multiple boards together, uh, then you can get uh, ground loops because of the voltage difference. If you compare that with the PC power supply, it's actually grounded. And that ground pin from the, the power socket is connected to the, the case of the power supply as well. Supply as well. And it's also connected to the, the, the ground output from the power supply. So if if all those ground levels are at the same voltage level, then you have much less issues. And for communication with, uh, with the opto isolator boards, I use I2C, and actually that works quite well for me. I know some people, they use uh, CAN bus because it's much more resilient for, uh, uh, against uh, the, these, these issues. But uh, if everything is grounded, then I2C 
works quite well for me. Um, once I had added eight boards to my board form, then I ran into the limits of the, the ACME cape I had because it had only support for eight, for powering eight boards. And so I thought, no, no I played a bit with KiCad, uh, so perhaps it's the time come to, to make something more complicated and combine multiple functionalities into a single board. So I thought about creating a board that could do all of power control, measurement, opto isolators, even USB serial, because not all boards have a USB serial converter on board. And some of them have serial ports at 3.3 volts, others at 1.8. And yeah, if I combine all of that, I probably will need a microcontroller and so I can put some intelligence in the board as well. So I settled for getting a, a TNC. Uh, if you don't know, a TNC is a, a small board with a, a microcontroller, which has some ARM Cortex core as well. It has RAM, flash, micro USB, which is easy to connect to, for example, the BeagleBone Black in a board controller. Uh, support for serial ports, I2C, GPU, CPIO, PWM. So that sounds like a, a good start because I didn't feel confident at that time to, to start soldering a, a small pitch microcontroller chips as self. So I developed a PCB where you could just uh, plug in the TNC here. Uh, as you can see on the picture here, it, uh, this supports control for two uh, uh, target boards. So here on this, here you see the, the power control and measurement part for the first channel. So power goes in, power goes out. There's a second power channel as well. Then I have two UR channels here with uh, built-in voltage translation. So you can run it with serial port for 1.8 volt, 3.3 volt, 5 volts. If you need real RS232, then you can get easily at an extension board with a max uh, 2323 uh, two, three, two, three, or 3232 three, two ship uh, to control. Uh, I have my bank of opto isolators here, so I can uh, provide virtual key press support for emulating key presses for uh, up to six switches. And since the TNC has uh, support for PWM, I also added uh, two RGB LEDs, which were originally intended for status, but uh, so far I didn't really do anything with that. <laughs> so on the, the software side, uh, so the TNC is usually programmed to a TNC Duino, which is some Arduino-like environment. Uh, I use Teensy Duino without the Arduino IDE because I'm more like uh, normal make files. And Teensy Duino supports one virtual serial port over USB using the CDC ACM protocol. So you can just plug in the Teensy in a USB port and talk to a virtual serial port. But it supports only one of them. While the idea I had was to use one of that for talking to the board and controlling it, and then having two of them to talk to the the real serial ports on the ships which would be ship which would be connected to the, the serial boards. So uh, to support that, I added support for dual and triple serial to the TNC Duino uh, software stack, and that was uh, integrated upstream. The software I run on the board, it's uh, some bare metal uh, C++ code with the event loop and a simple cooperative scheduler to take care of reading from serial ports, sending it over USB and vice versa. And uh, it provides USB host connectivity with three virtual serial ports, one for, uh, to talk to the board and control it, and uh, two real serial channels for serial consoles. You can find the code on uh, GitHub as well. So if, if you uh, talk to the first virtual serial channel, then you're greeted by, by this, which shows you the various commands that you can use to, to control the, 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 the opto-isolators, uh, power, uh, enable power, disable power, monitor it, uh, things like that. There's also a test uh, command, so you can e easily test all the functionality of the board. Um, then I wanted to add more boards to my form, and I wanted to add more of my own boards. Then I noticed an uh, annoying limitation. 
and this is that uh, USB CDC ACM uh, protocol. It uses three, three USB endpoints per serial port. While the USB uh, host in the BeagleBone Black supports a maximum of 16 endpoints. So if you put these two together, then you've discovered that you can only connect two of my board, two of those thin C's with running my code to one BeagleBone Black, which was an annoying limitation. So I talked to some people familiar with uh, USB and serial on Linux, and uh, I got pointed uh, by Johan Hovold to the Moxa U port serial uh, extensions. And they have support for up to 16 serial ports using only three endpoints. Everything is multiplexed over that. So what I did was uh, basically looking at the behavior of the Linux driver and then writing just enough support, support code on the, in Tinsidwino to, uh, to make it look like it's a Moxa U port device. And then, yeah, I had my three serial ports with less USB endpoints. An alternative uh, that was suggested to me was uh, to, to just write um, a complete new Linux driver that had just the functionality it needed, but the disadvantage of that is that it wouldn't work uh, with the standard stock driver and it uh, could have been more work. So using the Moxa u protocol means that it just works with the unmodified uh, Linux kernel. Okay, then uh, I wanted to add more boards. But unfortunately, at that time, uh, Bay Libre has uh, had sold out of uh, Acme power control boards. And my own board, oh, yeah, the TNC was no longer available as well uh, during the, the COVID and post-COVID periods. There's also a TNC 4.0 with a, a higher powered uh, microcontroller. It's been compatible, but was at that time also difficult to get. So, so I decided, yeah, what can we do? I uh, this just took the board I already have and I dropped the parts I didn't really need anymore. In the meantime, the number of boards without a USB serial converter were quite limited. So I don't, didn't need serial. The RGB LEDs, which I had intended for some automatic, sta automatic status control, they were not really used as well. So I just replaced the TNC by a I2C GPIO expander. And uh, then I could connect it to the, the board I already had. We are, I had fortunately thought about uh, adding an I2C expansion connector. So it was already quite future proof. And you can connect that board, of course, to any other single board computer, which is I2C. So, and then I ended up with this. Here you see it looks very similar to the previous board, but now you have a I2C GPIO expander. Yeah, the pictures look prettier and prettier because KiCad is getting better and better support for uh, 3D generation of uh, what you designed. And of course, I uh, updated my software to, to use it as well. Then after I designed the board and wanted to build it, I ran into another uh, supply chain issue. So before I started, I looked at the DigiKey website, yeah, whether I could order all components, great. When I wanted to order them, it turned out that a specific P-channel MOSFET that I had uh, picked for uh, power control was no longer available. Um, Fortunately, I could use uh, some other part, which was very similar, but that had uh, other uh, gate drive limitations, so I had to change the resistor values. Um, yeah, for future boards, perhaps I should uh, consider the packages. It seems that, uh, that the SOIC 8 packages are more popular now than the, the SOT 2.3. So this is also something you'd have to take into account when you design hardware. Uh, try to guess what will be available later and what won't be. <laughs> so to summarize the current state of my board form, now has a metal rack from uh, IKEA, 14 development boards, still a single power supply, which turns out to be sufficient. I had to add more Ethernet switches. And I still roll all the control hardware from uh, the, the five volt standby power of the PC power supply which is by now already two Pregelbone Blacks, the Acme board, the, 
the opto-isolator things, my own bo uh, BCU boards, USB hub, serial adapter. I was getting a bit worried that I run into the limits of the PC power supply, which supplies only 2.5 ampere uh, on the standby uh, pin, but so I added a voltage monitoring system there, and it turns out that it still only consumes 1.4 ampere, so, so I'm fine. Of course, I keep on getting more boards. <laughs> so now I'm thinking uh, for the future, I started uh, designing a, a board shown here. So the idea is that I would have uh, multiple <coughs> plug-in boards that plug into a larger backplane. And each of the individual plug-in boards would control uh, one uh, development board. So I have the power control part here. And yeah, for the opto isolators, serial you don't need anymore. The advantage of that is that I could uh, have multiple types of plug-in boards. Uh, I can envision one which has a USB power because lots of the small boards these days, they are powered by uh, USB and they have uh, the serial console going over the same USB port as well. So if you want to control that and you need some custom solution that will switch both power and the data of the, the board so I can use it. So the board, I, I designed it here. The, the bottom row of this uh, two times six uh, connector here, uh, as uh, it should be pin compatible with the PMOD uh, interface type one, just GPIO. So that means that you could use this board standalone connect it to any system with a PMOD connector, or you can just connect it to a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black or whatever you have, or you get, could connect it to the bigger backplane, backplane board I'm, uh, I'm still working on. Uh, yeah, so this one does not have the real power management, but it here has a current sensing resistor, which is then uh, the, the two sides are connected to the pins here, so the actual power measurement would be done on, uh, on the backplane. Now, if you're building your own board form, uh, I know what alternatives are there. I know that lots of people these days are remo using remote controlled power outlets. Uh, they're also useful for, for other purposes like controlling uh, your washing machine, and especially if you have solar panels, so you want to power it only when, when the sun is shining. Uh, for uh, emulating key presses or resetting, People use relay boards. I don't like, really like relay boards because they're meant for uh, higher loads and they can be quite noisy. If you just want to measure power uh, somewhere, then you can get breakout boards like uh, the, the, the Adafruit board here on, on the left. Then you, you don't have to solder, you just have to connect some wires and you can measure power consumption. If you want to go more complicated, uh, Linux automation, they have uh, a complete mini computer system to control a remote board. Um, yeah, if you have a, a very rare, expensive development board, it may be worth doing that. But if, for example, for controlling your Raspberry Pi, it's uh, overkill price-wise. Uh, it's still, yeah, if, if, other, if other people want to use a Raspberry Pi, they probably can buy. It's cheaper to buy one themselves, but still you, you may want to use automation in a board form locally. So now, uh, how would my ideal board form look like? Uh, if I want to think, would think really big, then I would be, uh, make it uh, uh, 84, uh, 48 volt DC powered, like uh, the professional telecom equipment, and have a port board DC DC converter. I would uh, make a pluggable architecture, much more advanced than the thing with the with the PMOD alike interface. I was, <laughs> I came up. Uh, um, yeah, I would want support for USB, isolated Ethernet, and, uh, media support. Uh, I'm not working on media support for Linux myself, so I don't have a, a real need there. And then for a backbone, you want something more high speed. The I2C is too slow, can't do, then perhaps something with PCI Express. I didn't really talk about uh, the software part. Uh, for controlling my board form, it's basically a collection of organically grown scripts. I know there are things like uh, LabGrid these days, but I started this a long time ago and I kept on enhancing it and it's working well for me. I do have a very ugly web server that 
that I run on one of my BeagleBone blacks, but it's quite limited, and it only can only show the things that are connected to that BeagleBone black, not to the other one. So now let's go to part two about the reboot access. So once you have a board farm, then people start to ask uh, questions about that. The first one is, can I set up a board farm myself too? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, uh, if you want to do that, uh, I recommend that you have a look at uh, uh, the video and slides from my presentation I gave in 2016, because it contains, also contains more low level information. Another thing that people say is, here's a new board, can you add that to your farm? Yeah, I like adding more boards. But unfortunately, I already have too many boards that I should add to my form. And then the third question is, can I get access to a board in your board farm? Yeah, that's difficult. You don't want to just give them SSH access and run them uh, whatever uh, scripts on your system that need root access to control GPIOs or whatever else. So uh, let's play a small game. So. Apparently, there won't be a closing game, this ELCE. So I thought, uh, let's put it, uh, let's include something in my presentation. So let's play uh, rock, paper, scissors. So I hope that you all know how, uh, how that works. So uh, can you please uh, stand up? And the idea is that uh, you answer this question by showing uh, the corresponding symbol. The question is, do you have a board form? Yes, no, but I want one, or no. Okay, let's see. So I, I show this, so everybody who, uh, who this can sit down, so the, the good answer, of course, is yes, or uh, I, don't, I, I don't think so, uh, I, I do want one. So if you, if you showed uh, this, please sit down. Let's move to the next question. Do other people have remote access to your systems? Yes, I don't think so. <laughs> or no? <laughs> okay, if you showed this, then please sit down. <laughs> So for the final question, uh, I'm going to make it a bit more difficult. Even if you have a tie with me, then you still lose. Does that include root access? <laughs> Do other people have root access to your system? <laughs> yes, I don't think so, no. <laughs> so please sit down. <laughs> uh, uh, unless you show the scissors. Well, we have some winners, good. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any prizes to distribute. Uh, yeah, it's a pity. I'm, I'm not Tim Bird. <laughs> so let's talk to, uh, about the system that uh, I developed to uh, access the, the, my board form in a rather secure way. So it's based upon two major design principles. And one of them is that each board as its own user account on the system, which is very similar to how uh, Android man manages uh, upper permissions. And the second one is to, uh, have out to do not implement authentication yourself, but uh, uh, offload that to SSH, which is similar to how the Gitolite uh, system works. So for that, I was inspired by uh, Kieran Bingham, who started uh, some lab control system himself, but uh, eventually that didn't continue. So the advantage of using SSH uh, is that you can control everything through SSH. So you don't need any special software on the client side, just SSH and rsync also running over SSH to upload uh, kernel images and uh, uh, DTB files. So I also wanted it to not be tied to any specific board for management software. It can work with whatever scripts you're using, if you're using LabGrid or your own things or something else, it should work. So there should be a, a clear separation between remote access and board farm infrastructure. And you as board farm maintain, maintainer and setup person should provide the necessary glue. Of course, because it's, there's still some remote access involved, uh, you want to keep it as simple as possible. So it's easy to review for correctness and security. 
So basically, the only things that this system needs to do is string comparison for uh, checking what command the user wants to execute, and then call into shell functions, scripts, external tools. Uh, I thought a lot about which language should I use. Uh, string comparison is actually fairly easy in C, but it's difficult from C to call it. Have shell functions and things like that. Uh, Bash is uh, a little bit more unsafe for doing string comparison. The user provides uh, all the string data, but it makes it very easy to call in, into shell functions. Uh, so I ended up with doing that. Uh, the server part is not that large, and uh, it's important if you write a shell script uh, that you use shell check to check for eventual uh, issues in your code. So how does it look like? So suppose you, you have your board farm already with multiple boards. Uh, you have some systems that are where the control the console. That's where the usually where the USB serial uh, USB port would connect to USB serial on the board. You have something control power for reset. You have a TFTP and NFS server. So what I added was a layer like this. You have the, the secure shell daemon on the left, which controls the, uh, which is controlled by the outside world. Every board has its own user with its own home directory. And SSH daemon will just look at the authorized keys the, uh, file, who is authorized to access it. And it's configured in such a, such a way that it can only run the from server script. Uh, to set it up, there's a subdirectory where you put all the keys of all the persons you want to give access to that board. And then there's a script that combines everything in the authorized keys file. Then you need a config file, which specifies the operations to implement. And these operations can either be just simple shell functions inside the config file. The config file itself is also uh, written in shell language. Uh, they can call into uh, executables in bin or somewhere in the pod. And other important files are the uh, a help text, which is shown to the user if he is used the help command. And then there's the access log file. So an example here is if you, you if I SSH into the the from server that uh, controls uh, the Salvatore exports, and I issue the help command, then I get this output. So the basic commands are console, which, you just, which gives you access to the, the serial console. Usually that's a running screen or something like that. And there are commands to, pow to power on the board and check the power status. Reset, board status. And then rsync, which is used to upload files. Typically, you, the user doesn't issue the rsync command itself, but basically that's what uh, rsync uses when you rsync to the to the user at uh, to the account here. And this runs, of course, the uh, the restricted version of rsync or rsync, so you can only upload to that directory and nowhere else. There are other commands. Uh, to wake up a board, either through a key press or by a wake on LAN. Uh, FRAM also has uh, support for locking. Uh, you can explicitly lock the board for access, but most of the commands that, uh, that do something important, like powering a board, powering on a board, will try to get access to the lock uh, themselves. Uh, so that means that other people will not disturb you as long as you have the lock. There's a default timeout of one hour, but the user can also explicitly release uh, a command. Another uh, command is the SSH proxy, which is used to easily connect to the SSH server running on a board. More about that later. If you're the administrator, then you get access to a few more uh, commands. Um, one of the important one here is the setup uh, part. This is completely optional, but uh, you can use that. The set setup can be called explicitly by the administrator, but it's also called automatically by uh, the other uh, commands. And uh, this is used to configure uh, some other uh, software things on the site, on the server side, that are specific to the user. So, for example, you can have uh, different NFS root file systems depending on uh, 
who is using the board. Now to the low-level parts. Uh, so the basically, I said before, that uh, the glue to control your farm uh, must be implemented by, by you. That can be done either through shell functions in the board config file, through scripts or external commands. And there uh, are five commands that, you, that are mandatory to implement, and the rest is optional. Let's have a look at a simple config file, uh, at the part of a config file. So you specify first who, is the who are the administrator users. You can have multiple uh, administrators separated by spaces. Um, then a sample function here to power on a board within a, sh a shell script here. And it's a shell function here. Um, as I said before, you don't have to implement everything in the config file. If it's not implemented in the config file and it's mandatory, then it's uh, uh, supposed to be an, uh, an external program or script, so for example, uh, the, the program to uh, open a, a serial console. Now let's get some uh, tips for uh, when you set up a, a software environment of your farm uh, using FRAM. Um, I always use GNU screen for connect to a serial port. Um, if you use screen, it's very important that you specify a proper screen RC file. Um, because by default, you can use, when you launch screen, you can open a new shell there, which is definitely not something that you want to let all users do that access your form because typically you're running this as root. Um, if you use screen with these parameters, then you can uh, easily connect to, to, then you can give uh, sessions a specific name and easily reconnect to them later. For serial ports, uh, you best use dev serial by ID and then the, the, the unique ID of the USB serial device. On some boards, this is not actually unique, which can cause uh, issues. Uh, but fortunately for uh, several USB serial uh, chips, there are programs available on the internet so you can program the serial number of the chip and then all of them do become unique. So uh, from also provides a sample screen RC file. Um, for my boards, um, I use uh, a common uh, base uh, Debian NFS root file system, and then I use per user overlays uh, using overlayFS, which means that uh, I don't need more, lots of space on the server. To let, and I have a sample script to set up the environment, so when a different user uses the the board that it will uh, enable a different overlay on top of the base uh, root file system. Uh, as your scripts typically have to control your farm through uh, uh, operations that are only allowed by the user, you can use sudo to, uh, to do that in a safe way. And if you have to log in on a remote system to control something as root, then uh, I advise you to use uh, per board SSH private keys without passphrases. If you have lots of boards, then uh, in, uh, if, if, if you are using boards at uh, multiple for remote forms, then uh, it can uh, be getting complicated to remembering everything. So the, uh, I also created a, a simple script called from, which will look into a from RC file in your home directory where you can add lines like this. Then you can just refer to uh, a board by a nickname and it makes it much easier. And for the, the SSH proxy command, it is a, a way to easily log into the SSH server running on the target board. Um, there's a special trick. You, you just add this to your uh, SSH config file, and then you can just SSH to the board, and it will, and it will work. Um, if you only use the boards locally, then you can just use the part in bold here. If you, if you also use the board, uh, on the road and it's in your own form, uh, like for example for my boards on my laptop I have a, a, the complete line with the match here, which means that if I'm locally at home it will look up the board in my local DNS server, it, it's there, it will use a direct SSH server. When I'm not at home it will enable the proxy command. So for the future, uh, yeah, I want to write better documentation. I'm thinking about console stuff, which is a feature that screen has that 
So it's basically a way to insert data into the uh, serial port uh, communication. So it can be useful if you have need to, to type a long boot command. Uh, adding multimedia en enhancements for cameras or something like that could be interesting. I had planned some demo, but I don't think I have time left. So that leaves us just with the thanks and acknowledgements for people who helped me in, in uh, the design, who are running their own board farm or running testing on my end. Of course, Renesas Electronics for uh, contacting me to do stream kernel work. I don't think we have time for questions, but up to do we? Yeah. Okay, perhaps one quick question. Yes, please. Uh, the most reliable, uh, everything works quite well. So people complain about USB, using USB on BeagleBone Black, but uh, I have more issues with uh, dropping USB serial connections on PCs than on BeagleBone Black, as long as you keep that number of endpoints into account. The most unreliable thing is uh, on one board I have problems with one uh, of, with the wake up signal because apparently the, the, the connector, it's, this, it's oxidizing or something like that. I thought about replacing it, but usually I just unplug it, plug it again, and then, then it works. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.